open your Bibles to Mark, if you would. Mark was written to the Romans, primarily, the Roman mindset. So the Romans were movers, they were doers. And we kind of like that idea. And we see Jesus moving and doing, acting. And Jesus, indeed, is and was a doer. Uh, how exciting is that? And we're looking especially uh, at 12 through 28 this morning. Uh, last week, we looked at verses 1 through 8, the ministry of John the Baptist, how he prepared the way, how he pointed the way to Christ. Uh, we looked at Jesus' baptism, 9 through 11, and how we talked about baptism doesn't save, but is an outward sign uh, of an inward happening. Uh, we remember Paul in prison uh, with Silas. Well, when there was an earthquake, he came out and the, and the prisoner said to Paul, what must I do to be saved? And he clearly said this, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. They were baptized after. But what must I do to be saved? Simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And the good news is not only did the jailer, but all his household believed. And after that, uh, they were baptized. How exciting. Uh, today, we'll uh, attempt to look at his temptation in verses 12 through 13 and 14 through 20, his preaching, and then 21 through 28, his power over the demonic. So as we said, John prepared the way uh, by being salt and light in his generation. We're called to be that same salt, that same light. John pointed the way, not to himself, but he pointed the way to the one that had the answer, Jesus. John didn't have the answer. John pointed to the answer. John wasn't the answer, but he pointed to the answer. Like you and I today, we're not the light of the world in the sense that Jesus is, but we are the light of the world in the sense that we reflect his light. And guess what? We point to others. How good are your pointers today? How good is my pointer? Do we point clearly, unambiguously, lovingly, and boldly to Christ? And then John said, I must decrease, he must increase. Less of me and more of him. I must diminish, he must grow in my life. Then we looked at the baptism of Jesus, right? We see the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the fact is, if you look at uh, Matthew 17, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the same thing happened. He was overshadowed by the Father, and the Father said, This is my beloved Son, but He said something in addition. Listen to Him. Hear Him. Dear friends, are we hearing? Are we listening to Him? That's going to make all the difference in how effective you and I are as believers. Are we really listening to Christ? And the, the thing is, when we say listening to Christ in a biblical sense, it always means doing what he says. It just doesn't mean, oh, I listened, yeah, it was good, and then go on our merry way. It means actually doing what he says. Now, as we look at Jesus' temptation, and temptation sometimes is so great that we give in to it. It's so great that we fall into it. But the good news is we don't have to. We can have victory over it. Let me tell you a little story. And this story illustrates how temptation can take hold of us if we're not careful. Have you ever heard the folk story of the bandit Jose Rivera, who became notorious in several little towns in Texas for robbing their banks and businesses? Finally, the townsfolk, weary of the constant plundering, hired a ranger to track down Jose Rivera in his hideout in Mexico and retrieve the money. The ranger at last arrived at a desolate ramshackle cantina. At the counter, he saw a young man enjoying his brew. At one of the tables, hands over his ample stomach, hat over his eyes, snored another patron. With much gusto, the ranger approached the young man at the bar and announced that he was on a mission to bring back Jose Rivera, dead or alive. Can you help me find him? He asked the young man. The young man smiled and pointed to the other person and said, 
uh, that is Jose Rivera. The ranger shifted his southern girth and ambled over to the sleeping bandit, tapping him on the shoulder. Are you Jose Rivera? he asked. The man mumbled, no speak English. The ranger beckoned to the young man to help him communicate his mission. In other words, to become a translator. The ensuing conversation was tedious. First, the ranger spoke in English, and the young man translated into Spanish. Jose Rivera responded in Spanish, and the young man repeated the answer to the ranger, back and forth. Finally, the ranger warned Jose Rivera that he had two choices. The first choice was to let him know that all the loot he had was stolen, in which case, if he'd give it, he could walk away free. Just give up all the loot that you stole, you could walk away free. The second choice was that if he did not reveal where the money was stashed, he would be shot dead instantly. Well, the young man translated the ultimatum. Jose Rivera pulled himself together and said to the young man, Tell him to go out of the bar, to turn to the right, go about a mile, he will see a well. Near the well, he will see a tall tree. Beside the trunk of that tree is a large concrete slab. He will need some help in removing it. Under the slab is a pit in the ground. If he carefully uncovers it, he will find the jewelry and most of the money I have taken. Now the translator. Watch him. The young man turned to the ranger, opened his mouth, swallowed, paused and said, Jose Rivera says, go ahead and shoot. You see, it was too much for the translator. He wanted it for himself. He fell into temptation. Now we see Jesus in the wilderness, tempted 40 days and 40 nights. It reminds us Moses fasting for 40 days and Israel spending 40 years in the wilderness and Elijah traveled toward the mountain of God for 40 days. We can see a resemblance there. But Jesus was resisting temptation. And by doing that, he showed that indeed he was the Messiah. Because if Satan could cause him to sin before he got to the cross, he would no longer be qualified to be our Savior. But he failed. Look at verses 12 and 13. Immediately the Spirit impelled Jesus to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. Very interesting. Jesus was tempted. We too will be tempted. Let me ask you this question. What is your greatest temptation? What is it? Is it sex? Is it money? Is it jealousy? Is it anger? Is it unforgiveness? What is your greatest temptation? We have to answer that. The fact is, it can, in Christ, be overcome. We can have victory over it. As a matter of fact, let's turn to Hebrews 4 for a moment, and we have that promise that tells us that it can be overcome. Matter of fact, it says an amazing thing, that Jesus himself was tempted like we were, like we are, yet without sin. Look at verse 15 of chapter 4. For we do not have a high priest, and that high priest is Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows what we go through when we're tempted. Believe me, he really, really does. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are. That's right. He's been tempted in all the categories that you and I have been tempted in. Yet, without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, we can always come before his throne and find 
his love and favor to help us in time of need. Always go to him. Sometimes that's the last one we go to uh, when we're tempted. You know, have you prayed about it? Have you gone to the Lord? Oh, I didn't think about that. Well, you know, that should have been the first thing we thought of going to him. He has the power. And here's the good news. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You might want to turn to that quickly. The good news is that 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us there is no temptation, no trial or no temptation that you have that has overtaken you but such as is common to man. So what you're going through, what you're being tempted with, what you're being tried with, guess what? Other Christians have too. You're not alone. You know, we might say, yeah, 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 sure. But mine is the worst. Mine is the worst. It's not like mine. No, no. It's common to man. But the good news here is God is faithful. God is faithful. Even when he, we feel he's not there. Don't go by your feelings, friends. Go by the word of God. Go by scripture. Our feelings can be the worst liars, okay? Go by Scripture. God is faithful. Uh, we can't even comprehend fully what that means because we think of a faithful dog, right, or a faithful human being. Uh, but God is far more faithful than any of those comparisons and more. God is faithful. He's right there. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. He knows your breaking point. He knows your limit. He knows what you can handle. He will not allow you to be tempted more than you're able. But what, what will he do? But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it and stand up under it. Now, that's the promise. That is the wonderful promise. So let's draw near with confidence, with boldness to that throne of grace when we are tempted. Very much so. Turn to Matthew chapter 4, which expands for us on the temptation of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4. We see Jesus was led up by the Spirit, interestingly enough, right? Into the wilderness to be tempted. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God. That can be translated, Since you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God, Command that these stones become loaves of bread. Well, he, he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was also human. He must have been very hungry. All right? Hey, listen. listen. There's nothing like freshly baked bread. I mean, the smell of it, the taste of it, the texture of it. Now, can you imagine after fasting, uh, fasting 40 days and 40 nights? So uh, Satan knows how to tempt us. He really does. He knows our weak times, and he knows what to use. And many times he's successful if we let him be. So if you're the son of God, change these stones uh, into bread. He answered and said, quoting from Deuteronomy, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Say, yeah. Physical food sustains us, but my spirit, my inner being is being sustained by the word of God. Very much so. I didn't stop there. The devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, since you are, or if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, right? And on their hands, they will bear you up so you won't strike your foot against the stone. Now, I want you to notice the devil quotes scripture, but so does Jesus. He quotes it out of context. He misuses it, as we see in the cults, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and groups like that to twist and distort scripture. And, uh, and many who are uh, just uh, selfies and twisting scripture, they read the Bible and they twist this and they twist that because they like it better than what the text actually says in context. So Jesus responded to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And he responds back. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. It must have been a gorgeous sight. That's all I can say. I mean, we've all seen beautiful scenery in, in Israel when I was there, beautiful scenery. 
uh, we're up in the Shenandoah Valley, very pretty, uh, very nice, uh, gorgeous scene. The Grand Canyon, I've never been there, but I understand it's just absolutely massive and gorgeous to see, and, and other places. But imagine being shown all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He says, all these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. Simple as that. Just, just fall down and worship me. Worship me as God. Ooh, wow, it's pretty powerful. Then Jesus said, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Wow. Did you notice he said the Lord your God to him? There's only one God, and he's your God. And serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and began to minister to him. So we see here in the temptations many things. He tried to make Jesus doubt his divine sonship. If you are the Son of God, why don't you do this? If you really are, or since you are God's Son, uh, do this. You know, prove yourself. And then showing him all the kingdoms of the world, he, he deals with... Um, uh, trying to uh, accuse uh, perhaps Jesus of unrighteous ambitions. All these things will I give you if you fall down and worship me. But isn't Satan like that? Doesn't he do the same? He tries to make us, for instance, doubt our salvation. Are you really saved? You say you're a Christian, but are you really saved? Look at what you said. Look at what you did. Look at how you think at times. Look at how you act. Are you sure you really belong to Christ? Are you sure you're really saved? Oh, he loves to cause doubt. He accuses us of unrighteous ambitions. But when many times our ambitions and goals are pure, but he says, you know why you're doing that. Don't give me that baloney. You know the real reasons behind it, right? And very often uh, we fall for it. Indeed. See, friends, we are in spiritual warfare. This is real. And if we're kidding ourselves that warfare isn't real, we've, we've fallen into the trap. Let me give you an example of that. A true story, by the way. A Christian leader, we'll call him Steve, as he was traveling by plane, he noticed that a man sitting two seats over was thumbing through some little cards and moving his lips. The man looked professional with a goatee, and graying brown hair. And Steve uh, uh, placed him around maybe 50-ish. Guessing the man was a fellow believer, Steve leaned over to engage in conversation. Looks to me like you're memorizing something. Maybe he thought he was memorizing scripture. He said, no, actually I was praying, the man said. Steve introduced himself. I believe in prayer too, he said. Well, I have a specific assignment, the man said with a goatee. Well, what's that, sir? Steve asked. I'm praying for the downfall of Christian pastors. And, I, it, and Steve said, well, I certainly fit into that category. Steve said, is my name on the list? He said, no, not on my list. Isn't that interesting? One into Satanism was praying for the downfall of Christian pastor, pastors. You see, spiritual warfare is something we must prepare for. Uh, we don't wait till it comes upon us. We must be ready. That's why it talks about the full armor of God in Ephesians 6, putting on that full armor. Recently, the National Geographic ran an article about the Alaskan bull moose. Probably you don't think of the Alaskan bull moose very often, uh, but they're very interesting. The males of the species battle for dominance during the fall breeding season, which would be now, literally going head to head with antlers crunching as they collide. Often the antlers are the only weapons they have that are broken. And when that happens, it's a sure defeat from them when they have broken antlers. The heftiest moose with the largest and strongest antlers, that's the one that triumphs. Therefore, the battle fought in the fall is really one in the summer when the moose eats continually. The one that consume, con, consumes the best diet for growing antlers, gaining weight, will be the heaviest in the fight. Those that eat inadequately sport weaker and antlers 
and less bulk. Now, there's a lesson for us when we look at the bull moose. And here's the lesson. Spiritual battles await. Satan will choose a season to attack each one of us in our life. It will be there. Will we be victorious or will we fall? Much depends on what we do now before the war begins. The bull moose principle, enduring faith, strength, and wisdom for trials are best developed before they are needed, not when they are needed. So we spend time in the Word of God, memorizing Scripture, meditating on it, prayer, living for Christ, spending time in our daily quiet time. And when the battle comes that day, we are ready and we will win. It's real. Spiritual warfare is real. Look at verses 14 through 20 of our text. How powerful that is. We think of Jesus' preaching now after John had been taken into custody. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the kingdom of God was that earthly messianic kingdom that Messiah would bring in uh, when he would come. And it says, As he was going by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. He said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Very important. I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired servants. And they went away to follow him. So Jesus calls his earliest disciples. So Jesus said to them, in verse 17 especially, when he is calling them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Now you're catching fish, but soon you'll be catching men. You say, I, I, I don't know how to catch men. I, I, I don't know how to catch fish. That's all right. You follow me, and I will show you. I will make you become fishers of men. So he calls Simon and Andrew. Yes, he called James and John, but he calls us for the great work of the church. Go into all the world, share the gospel. And we do that in our part of the world where we are right now. So he says, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. Dear friend, the church on the whole today has not become fishers of men. They're not sharing the gospel. They're not spreading the good news. Why? Because Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. If we're truly following Christ, the most natural result will be to tell others about him. It just follows. It just follows. Absolutely amazing. Do you know 95%, we shared this stat last week, 95% of all Christians have never won a soul to Jesus Christ. Never led someone to Christ. 80% of all Christians do not consistently witness for Christ. Less than 2% are involved in the ministry of evangelism. 71% do not give toward financing the Great Commission. Absolutely amazing. From Barna, George Barna, Answers to Evangelism. Nearly 85% of all Americans who accept Jesus Christ as Savior do so before reaching the age of 13 years old. 8% of Americans are saved after the age of 50. What percentage of people in the church have never led anyone to Christ, as we said, 95. And this might scare us. The majority of church members are not saved. 
Wow. Now, if that's anywhere near the truth, that's scary because that would simply mean they're religious, they attend church regularly, but they're really not right with God. And how they live the rest of the week demonstrates that. Mm. Are we sure that we're getting the message to people? Listen to this. George Sweeting in his book had the chance of meeting George personally. He was president of the Moody Bible Institute when I was attending. George Sweeting in his book, The No Guilt Guide for Witnessing, tells of a man by the name of John Currier, who in 1949 was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Later, he was transferred and paroled to work on a farm near Nashville, Tennessee. In 1968, Currier's sentence was terminated, and a letter bearing the good news was sent to him. But John never saw the letter, nor was he told anything about it. Life on the farm was hard and without promise for the future. Yet John kept doing what he was told even after the farmer who he had worked for died. Ten years went by. Then a state parole officer learned about Currier's plight, found him, and told him that his sentence had been terminated ten years ago. He was a free man. Dr. Sweeting concludes the story by asking this. What would it matter if someone sent you with an important message? The most important message in your life, and year after year, the urgent message was never delivered. Think about that. Someone sent you with an important message, the most important message of your life, and year after year, that message was never delivered. We who have heard the good news and experienced freedom in Christ are responsible to proclaim it to others still enslaved by sin. Are we doing all we can to make sure that people get the message? We see the connection. Man, you say, Lord, I, I hang my head. I'm not, I'm not doing all that I can to make sure that people get the message. And they're still enslaved in sin. And I have the message. I'm not doing all I can. You see, one writes, if being a Christian is worthwhile, then the most ordinary interest in those with whom we come in contact would prompt us to speak to them of Christ. If the New Testament is true, and we know it is, who has given us the right to place the responsibility for soul winning on the shoulders of others than our own? If they who reject Christ are in danger is it not strange that we who are so sympathetic when the difficulties are physical or temporal should apparently be so devoid of interest as to allow our friends and neighbors and kindred to come into our lives and pass out again without a word of invitation to accept Christ and say nothing of the peril that they will soon experience without Christ. If today, like the Bible says, is the day of salvation, and it does, if tomorrow may never come, if life is unequally certain, how can we eat, drink, and be merry when those who live with us, work with us, walk with us, and love with us are unprepared for eternity as they are unprepared for time? I don't know about you, but I tell you, tremendous conviction comes over me when I think about this. If Jesus called his disciples to be fishers of men, who gave us the right to be satisfied with making fishing tackle or pointing the way to fishing banks instead of going ourselves to cast out the net to have them filled? 
if Jesus himself went seeking the lost, if Paul the apostle was in agony because his kinsmen, according to the flesh, knew not Christ, why should we not consider it worthwhile to go out after the loss until they are found? Why? If I am to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and we will, to render an account for the deeds done in my body, what shall I say to him if my children are missing, if my friends are not saved, or if my employer or employee should miss the way I have been faithless. If I wish to be approved at last, let me remember that no intellectual superiority that I have, no eloquence in preaching, no absorption in business, no shrinking temperament, or no spirit of timidity can take the place or be an excuse for my not making an honest, sincere, prayerful effort to win others to Christ. Wilbur J. Chapman writes those words. And I tell you, I just about melted as I went through them. Because I'm going to stand before that judgment seat of Christ. Not for salvation, but for how I've neglected to share the only message that can save with my family, with my friends, with my classmates, with my coworkers, I will. Wow. 21 through 22 as we close, actually uh, moving down to 28, it talks about Jesus now going to a synagogue. We might say going to a church. What does he find in there? He finds a person with a demon. Do demons go to church? I suppose so. They went into a synagogue. They were there. Exactly. And he entered the synagogue, and he was beginning to preach and teach to them. And they were amazed at his authority. As a matter of fact, one person heard Jesus speak. They said, go get Jesus. Bring him back. They couldn't do it. Well, why couldn't they do it? You know what they said about Jesus? Never have we heard a man speak as this man spoke. You see, Jesus spoke with authority. Why? Well, because he's God, clothed in human flesh. Because he has all authority, being the creator of the universe. Yes, he cast out demons, like he did here. He stilled the wind and the waves. He raised the dead. He multiplied bread and fish. He is God. He is absolute authority. And when we think about this, they were all amazed. They were saying, verse 27, What is this new teaching that he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him? And news about him spread all over. Dear friends, we have authority in Christ over all the powers of darkness. We have all that we need in him. I want to ask you, does his word have authority in your life today? Does it speak to you with authority? You see, demons recognize Jesus. And you know what? They recognize Jesus in us. If we're walking in the Spirit, by his word, if we're living in God's power, they do. Well, what does James tell us to do to have that victory? How did Jesus have the victory in Matthew 4? Well, it tells us in James 4, 7, and 8, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. You notice the first thing in James 4, 7, and 8 is submit to God, right? That's the first thing. That's where we get the power, submitting to God. Then once we submit to God, guess what? Then we can resist the devil. You see, because he sees God's power behind it. <coughs> and the devil will flee. We also have Ephesians 6, right? <coughs> Ephesians 6, what does that tell us? We have the armor of God that empowers us, that clothes us. So the question is, as we look at today's text, <coughs> are we actively witnessing today? 
Am I becoming a fisher of men? Do I really care that people are dying and perishing around me, including those of my own family? Do we use his powerful word when tempted? Are we submitting and resisting? Are we convinced about the power and authority we have in Christ to do warfare? I love what Romans 8 says. We overwhelmingly conquer through Christ who loved us. We are more than conquerors. <coughs> Excuse me. That's what he promises. And that's what we can be today. Well, I trust God spoke to your heart as he did to mine today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. And Lord, may we be willing to surrender to you, to yield to you. May we become fishers of men. May we care. And may we realize that we have power and authority over all the plans and forces of Satan so that we can be more than conquerors. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.